Hey everyone, welcome back to Crown Corner, the channel where we dive into the wild world of entitled people and their unbelievable stories. Hope you enjoy it. And without further ado, let's go. Hi everyone, it's my first time posting here. My name is Kate. I'm 23 years old. I work at a diner that I love, and I spend most of my free time with my best friend, Jake. It all started a few months ago when I met a guy named Ross. He was charming, good-looking, and seemed like a genuinely nice person. We hit it off immediately, and before I knew it, we were dating. However, things started to change when I introduced him to my friend. At first, I thought it was just me being paranoid, but after a while, it became clear that Ross had a problem with Jake. He would always make snide comments about him, and every time we hung out with him, Ross would find a way to leave early. I tried to talk to him about it, but he would always brush it off and say he just didn't like Jake's personality. It wasn't until a few weeks ago that I found out the real reason. Jake had been seeing a therapist for the past year, and Ross had somehow found out. He thought that Jake was weak for needing therapy, and he wasn't a real man. I was shocked and disgusted by Ross's behavior, and I knew that I had to do something about it. That's where my plan came in. I decided to throw a party at my house and invite all of our friends, including Ross and Jake. However, I made sure to invite a few extra people as well. These were people who I knew didn't particularly like Ross and would be more than happy to help me out. The night of the party arrived and everything was going great. We were all having fun, drinking, and playing games. Then I saw Ross making his way to the kitchen. I followed him, pretending that I needed another drink and caught him pouring something into Jake's drink. What are you doing? I asked, trying to keep my voice steady. Ross looked up, surprised to see me. Just adding a little something to Jake's drink, he said casually, What is it? I... Just a little laxative. I thought it would be funny, he said with a smirk. That's not funny, Ross. That's disgusting. Oh, lighten up, Kate. It's just a joke. At that moment, I knew that my plan was going to work perfectly. Hmm. I walked back into the living room and announced that we were all going to play a game. It was a simple game of truth or dare, but I had a plan. I made sure that Ross was the first one to go. Truth or dare, Ross? I asked with a smile. Dare, he said confidently. I dare you to drink the cup of water that's been sitting in the sink all day, I said, pointing to the cup on the counter. Ross hesitated for a moment, looking around the room for support. However, nobody was going to help him out. Everyone knew what he had done, and they were all eager to see him get what he deserved. With a look of disgust on his face, Ross picked up the cup and took a big gulp. The room erupted in laughter as Ross ran to the bathroom, retching and gagging. That's what you get, Ross, I said, feeling a sense of satisfaction that I had never felt before. As Ross stumbled out of the bathroom, his face twisted with rage. You think you're so clever, don't you? He spat at me. Well, let me tell you something, Kate. You may have won this little game, but I'll get you back ten times worse. You just wait and see. I could feel my heart racing as Ross took a step towards me. His fists clenched tightly at his sides. I knew that I needed to act fast before he did something that he would regret. Ross, stop, I said firmly, taking a step back. I don't know what's gotten into you, but this is not the person that I want to be with. I'm breaking up with you. Ross's eyes widened in shock. What? You can't be serious. I am serious, I said, my voice shaking slightly. I can't be with someone who would do something like that to my friend. And if you think that you can threaten me or anyone else, then you're not the kind of person that I want to have in my life. With that, I grabbed Ross's arm and led him towards the door. He tried to resist, but I was stronger than he was. As I pushed him out of the house, I could hear him shouting obscenity and threats at me. But I didn't care. I was relieved as I closed the door and locked it behind him. It was over. I had stood up for myself and my friend, and I had gotten rid of someone who didn't deserve to be in my life. I turned around to see Jake looking at me with a mixture of gratitude and concern. Are you okay? He asked. Yeah, I'm fine. I'm just glad that's over. Jake put his arm around me, and together we went back into the living room to rejoin our friends. As we sat down on the couch, I realized that I had never felt more empowered in my life. I had stood up for what was right, and I had come out on top. And as for Ross, well, he could try to get revenge all he wanted. But I knew that I was stronger than he was, and that I would never let him or anyone else bring me down again. So anyway, I, 41 female, have been living in the apartment complex for five years now. 
I had some ongoing issues recently with a neighbor who is not to sound unladylike and entitled A8. He blasts music when he is home and smokes. I can smell it in the stairway. I generally try not to say anything to my neighbors because we all have to get along and hey, he usually doesn't blast his music past 10 p.m., which is the quiet time, so I let it slide the few times he does. But he has this other thing that is affecting other residents and is downright rude. We have a small parking lot behind the building and there is a small driveway to get in and out. There is plenty of parking in the complex, which houses, I guess, 150 residents. However, the entrance exit to this parking lot is a driveway, and you can't park there because it is a fire zone, but my neighbor downstairs, a male about 22, I will call F, will often park there. Many of the neighbors have been annoyed as it is very narrow, and it's extremely hard to go down it when a car is illegally parked on one side. There have been a couple of times when I and others had to go onto the sidewalk to avoid hitting his car or van, which can be dangerous. So last night, I came home a bit late and had to park in a different lot. It was probably not even 10 feet further walk from me because that rear lot I like was full, and there was still plenty of parking elsewhere in the complex. Well, a car was parked in the fire zone, so I took a picture. About two hours later, another car was now parked behind it in the fire zone. I took another picture. A neighbor tried to enter the lot. There was some parking available now, and after he parked, he asked me whose cars they were. I wasn't sure. He was very upset because he had to get on the other side to avoid hitting them. I tried to call the towing number that is posted on the signs telling us where not to park or we would be towed. I then knocked on my neighbor's door to ask who the cars belonged to, and he said his guests, and he just casually mentioned he told them to park there. I explained they needed to move their cars because they were blocking traffic. He did so. This morning I stopped by the leasing office after getting some advice to do so and explained this wasn't the first time it happened, but it was the first time it happened, but it was the first time I was speaking up about it and other neighbors had this issue with it. This was a fact. I take walks through the complex often and generally am friendly with my neighbors, so we have talked about it before. The head of maintenance was there and told me I had any issue to call the emergency number for after hours and tell them to get the tech on duty to call me and to say he, he, Dropped his name here as Bob. Said to call the towing company directly because they have his private direct line and they will have cars towed. Well, at about 4.30 p.m. today, my neighbor came knocking on my door. I opened it a little and we chatted. He told me he didn't appreciate how I had insulted his guests by calling them idiots. I didn't recall saying that, but maybe I did. I did explain that due to having a neurological disorder and it raining yesterday... I was in a lot of pain, so while I don't recall saying that I may have, and I apologize for that. He went on and on about how he is a firefighter, and he would know if there was a fire and would move the car. I tried to explain to him that regardless, he can't just park in the fire zone. That there are over 100 people in this complex, and there is plenty of parking, and we all have our own situations that don't justify parking in the fire zone. He ranted about how much he pays in rent, and I told him we all pay rent. For example... I have a neurological disorder. The guy across the hall from me is a military veteran. There are elderly people in the complex, and when he parks there, it blocks the traffic for everyone. Anyway, he basically told me he knows the cops in town, and I advised him next time. I'm just going to have the cars towed, and he pouted and said he was not going to park there anymore, so not to worry. I was shaken up, so after I calmed down, I went across the hall. There are four apartments in this building, and asked my neighbor there if he overheard the conversation. He did and advised me he will let the office know. He also advised he will call if F is, parking there again tonight because he didn't know it was him and he was upset as well. I then went downstairs to see my other neighbor and he had heard F as well and told me he too would be speaking to the property management office in the morning as well. I then texted my very close childhood friend whom I will call M and told him about the situation with F flaunting his status as a firefighter here in town. M was my senior prom date. He advised me that what F did was wrong and very unprofessional by saying that, and he should know. He was the former fire chief for the department that F currently works in, and so was M's father. In fact, the current one is still a very good friend of the family. I will update you guys once I get an update from him. Update. Not a huge update, but one of the things that F mentioned to me was how I am the only one who has an issue with him parking in the fire lane. Well, that's not the case. See, some of the neighbors have politely nicknamed me the walker that don't know my name, but know me from the complex, because I take walks daily and nightly to get my steps in. As a result, I know several of the people here by name, 
I have given the few feral cats names, and I tend to know where most of the kids live, not as an intentional stalker, but because I will see the kids running in and out of the buildings as I walk past. As a result, most people will casually ask me if I know, say, who someone belongs to, or whose bike or car, etc. Well, this week I had no less than four neighbors ask me point-blank if I knew the owners of the two cars that were blocking the parking lot. I casually mean helpfully told them they were guests of one of the tenants and told them my neighbor's name and apartment number. I also advised them how he has parked there before. Well, several of the neighbors had taken photos of him parking there but had no clue who it was, so they didn't report it sooner. Now they are reporting it. One actually told me he had half of the mind to yell at F when he found out F was so nasty to me about parking there, but said instead he will send the photos he has to the property management. Update 2. So, a few months back, I mentioned a neighbor of mine who feels entitled to park in fire zones, even if it blocks everyone else. A few nights ago, he blocked some cars in again by parking in the fire zone. I did what I was told by a prior property manager. We have a new one, and called 911. While I was on the phone with 911, my neighbor came out to curse at me. The dispatcher was concerned and said he was sending the cops and for me to go into my apartment. While I was walking back to my apartment, he came out of his, and he and his Jeff started yelling and spitting at me. I recorded it, but when I later showed it to the police, they said it was not him harassing me because I responded back. It was an argument. I reached out to the property manager who basically told me that I was the problem. I told him other neighbors had mentioned to me that they have called the office to complain about parking violators, but nothing gets done. He said that was a lie. I am the only one who does, which is bees. I've actually watched other neighbors call to complain. He also told me how my neighbor feels like I am picking on him by calling the police the other night. I said, if he hadn't parked where he did, I wouldn't have called the police, and he needs to owe up to his part of the problem. The property manager continued to defend him, saying just because he was breaking rules is no reason for me to report him, and kept trying to say that it was my fault, and he feels like I am being mean to him for no reason. I told him that my neighbor needs to toughen up. He chose to park in a fire lane that clearly says no parking and knows she is blocking people in. I then got a little hot-headed and said, well, what does he think happens to women who are attacked? The first thing we were asked is how we brought it on ourselves. Maybe he needs to think about how he's bringing this on himself and realize that women who are attacked have it much worse. The conversation ended not long after that, and the manager later sheepishly admitted that my neighbor shouldn't be parking there and he would take measures such as cameras, etc., to try to prevent it from happening. I don't expect him to, but the next time my neighbor is yelling and spitting at me, I will just record it and not hawk back, and call the police and tell them that per what they told me the other night, that's harassment. Many years ago, as I leisurely roamed the aisles of Walmart, searching for irresistible deals on things I didn't really need, My attention was captured by the presence of a stunning woman in her early 30s. I found myself standing amidst the tool and car section, contemplating a better impact tool and some high-quality floor mats for my beloved truck. Suddenly, she appeared, breaking the silence with a cheerful yoo-hoo. I need some help. At that moment, I couldn't help but notice the fashion files I had unknowingly committed. You see, I have a fondness for vests. And on that particular day, I had opted to wear my sparkly, light blue vest with delightful swirls and tassels. Its resemblance to the attire worn by Walmart employees became evident to me, although it was far more flamboyant. Despite this minor wardrobe misstep, I decided to extend my assistance to the lady, thinking that lending a hand wouldn't do any harm. Certainly, how can I help you? I replied with a smile. She explained that she needed a video game from a locked cabinet and wondered if I could retrieve it for her. Amused, I chuckled slightly and attempted to clarify the situation, assuming she required help with something heavy, hard to reach, or perhaps finding a specific item. Actually, I don't work here, and I don't have access to those cabinets, I explained. However, as I delivered my explanation, the sweetness on her face gradually transformed into anger. She erupted in a tirade, accusing me of deceiving her and lying to her face while pointing out my vest's resemblance to the Walmart uniform. She threatened to ensure my termination. Throughout her outburst, I made every effort to calm her down and reiterate that I genuinely didn't work at Walmart, emphasizing that my vest was simply a fashion choice. However, her frustration grew, and she concluded that I was spinning vile lies to an innocent woman attempting to purchase a gift for her son. Raising her open hand in slow motion, 
she prepared to slap me. In that critical moment, three distinct thoughts raced through my mind. Firstly, a surge of anger surged within me, urging me to retaliate against this offensive woman. Secondly, I realized there were no surveillance cameras in the aisle, meaning most people would likely believe her over me, the peculiarly dressed individual. Lastly, I made a decision to play along, accepting the slap. I braced myself for impact, but my instincts kicked in a bit too forcefully. As her hand made contact with my face, my head collided with a nearby shelf. Blood began to trickle down my face as I gazed up from the floor. Amidst the pain and chaos, a voice echoed, exclaiming, Oh my God! I saw another woman approaching, drawn by the commotion who had witnessed the entire incident unfold before her eyes. My attention then shifted back to my assailant, and what I observed in her eyes wasn't remorse, shock, or any indication of regret for her violent action. All I saw was fear, fear of the consequences she would face for her reckless behavior. Realizing she couldn't escape, she attempted to flee, but the witness implored her to halt. In a split second, I grasped her ankle, causing her to stumble and crash onto the floor, resulting in a severe blow to her face. I later discovered that she lost her two front teeth in the fall. Though I felt remorse for causing her harm, I couldn't allow her to evade accountability. After the police arrived, providing statements and administering basic first aid as my wound was merely superficial, I witnessed my attacker being escorted into a police car while she hurled a barrage of threats and obscenities at me. Witnessing her swift capture brought me a sense of relief and closure. Enjoying the stories yet? If you do, please subscribe, like, and comment. Let me take you back in time, over a decade ago, when the events of this story unfolded. As a resident of Saskatchewan, Canada, known for its bone-chilling winter temperatures, I was filled with excitement when the opportunity arose to visit my dad and stepmom in Texas during the Christmas season. Little did I know that their winter weather would feel like a mild spring to me. Throughout my stay, I found myself comfortably clad in shorts and tank tops, relishing the milder climate. Now let me introduce you to the key players in this tale. Firstly, there is me, a 16-year-old female embodying the stereotype of Canadian politeness, unless someone pushes me too far. Next, we have the entitled mom, who epitomizes the notorious Karen archetype. Then. There's the entitled dad, a firm believer in outdated gender roles, convinced that women should unquestioningly obey and serve him. Lastly, their son, an innocent-looking six-year-old who unwittingly becomes part of this encounter. Now, let's set the stage. It's the week after Christmas and we find ourselves at Target. Here I am, donning a pair of shorts that were not excessively short, mind you, but were thoughtfully purchased by my mom, a Catholic teacher, who always ensured I dressed appropriately. I also wore a tank top that revealed a hint of cleavage, once again chosen by my mom. I was out shopping with my stepmom, who needed to pick up some groceries. As I perused the clothes section, immersed in my own world of music with both earphones plugged in, an unexpected interruption jolted me from my reverie. The ensuing conversation was so bewildering that it's etched firmly in my memory. Entitled, Mom E.M., Where Are Your Parents? Me. I'm sorry. What? Is something wrong? E.M., I asked, where are your parents? Or are you too stupid to understand? Me, lady, I don't know what your problem is, but please leave me alone. E.M., no, where are your parents? Me, may I ask why you want to know? E.M., because you're too young to be by yourself and dress like that. I'm calling police. Me, um, what? Listen, lady, I'm old enough to brass clothes alone, and there's nothing wrong with my outfit. E.M. Yes, there is. Didn't your parents teach you to respect yourself? Me. Okay, listen, I'm not from around here. I'm just visiting for Christmas. Please leave me alone. E.M. No, you're lying. I know you're from here. You need to learn to dress appropriately for the weather. Just then, a towering figure over six feet tall approached. He was accompanied by his son, whom he was dragging along. It's important to note that, at the time, I stood at a mere four feet seven inches, significantly shorter than my peers. Nevertheless, anyone could see that I was unmistakably a teenager, not a child. Entitled Dad A.D., what's happening here? E.M., I was simply telling this young girl that she should wear proper clothes. Me, and I was just explaining that I'm not from here. 
I live in Saskatchewan. AD. That place doesn't exist. Stop lying. My wife is right. We homeschool our child because of people like you. We don't want him to be corrupted. Me. Actually, it does exist. It's a province in Canada. DM. Shut up. No one asks for your opinion. Me. Turning to the dad so you think people like me are the reason you homeschool your son. Maybe if he went to school, he would learn where Canada is. EM. Start screaming even louder you're from here and you enjoy dressing like that. You're a cheap witch and your mother is probably the same. At this point, my anger reached its peak. My mom, being a single parent as my dad was never truly present in my life, had raised me to be strong. Say what you want about me, but when it came to defending my mom, I had no mercy. With determination, I marched towards the front of the store knowing that employees would be there to assist. The entitled mom and dad trailed behind, still clutching their son's hand. Me. Listen carefully and listen well. I am not from Texas. I am from Saskatchewan, Canada. I do not have your southern accent. I am not a child, and I am neither dressed nor behaving inappropriately. A.D., seething with anger, invaded my personal space, his voice escalating as he threatened to have me arrested. His proximity was so close that I could feel the spray of his spit hitting my face. He then grabbed me, claiming I would be imprisoned from that moment onward. That was when I took action. Swiftly, I delivered a well-aimed knee strike to his vulnerable area, and as he crumpled in pain, I followed up with a powerful kick to his face. He lay on the ground, one hand shielding his injured face and the other gripping his pelvis. I had landed a solid blow, and I felt a sense of pride. By this time, security had been summoned, and the police were on their way. As an officer engaged in a conversation with me, I requested that they contact my mom and bring her to the front so she wouldn't be searching for me. The request was fulfilled, and as I waited for her arrival, I began explaining the incident to the officer. I presented my identification, which clearly indicated that not only was I indeed from Saskatchewan, but I was also only 16, thus a minor. Oh, how much more trouble the entitled dad was out to find himself in. My mom arrived at the scene, seething with fury. The officer inquired if I wished to press charges, and I inquired about the process as a minor residing in Canada. The officer explained the necessary steps, and I agreed to move forward. However, I also expressed my concerns to the officer regarding the well-being of the young boy. If his parents reacted in such a hostile manner in public, it raised serious doubts about his treatment in private. The officer acknowledged my concerns, understanding the gravity of the situation. Emergency medical services were summoned for both E.D., who may have suffered a broken nose courtesy of my kick, and for me as a precautionary measure to assess any potential injuries. I was given a clean bill of health. The boy's grandmother was contacted to come and pick him up. She appeared genuinely kind and sincerely apologetic for her son and daughter-in-law's behavior. As I departed with my mother, I glimpsed a D&EM seated in the back of two police cars. Aftermath. While I don't possess all the intricate details, I can share what I know about the aftermath. In my case, EM was found guilty of harassment, and 80 faced charges of harassment and assault against a minor. Moreover, the police conducted a search of their vehicle and property, which resulted in the discovery of a significant quantity of illegal drug. As a result, they faced additional legal consequences that would likely keep them behind bars for an extensive period of time. I'm not a vengeful person, but I don't take kindly to bullies. My name is Sophie, and I'm a 25-year-old college graduate who recently moved to a new city for a job in marketing. I thought I'd made some new friends when I met a group of people at a coffee shop near my apartment, but it turns out they were just looking for someone to pick on. It all started when I shared a photo on social media of a DIY project I was working on, a new headboard for my bed. I was pretty proud of it, and I thought it would be nice to share with my new friend. But instead of getting compliments, I got ridiculed. One of the guys, a smug 27-year-old named Chad, said my project looked like something a kindergartner would make. I brushed it off, thinking maybe he was just joking around. But it only got worse from there. Every time I talked about something I was interested in or proud of, Chad and his cronies would mock me or belittle me. It got to the point where I didn't even want to share anything about myself anymore. I started to avoid them, but they seemed to take pleasure in following me around and making fun of me in public. 
One day, I was walking to a yoga class when I saw them coming toward me. I tried to hurry past them, but Chad blocked my path. Well, 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 look who it is, he said, grinning. Little Misty. What do you have for us today? I tried to walk around him, but he stepped in front of me again. Come on, show us something. Maybe a macaroni necklace? I was seething with anger, but I refused to give him satisfaction of seeing me upset. Instead, I just brushed past him and kept walking. But as I sat in yoga class, seething with anger, I started to come up with a plan. I was going to show Chad and his friends that I wasn't someone they could just bully and walk all over. I was going to get revenge. I started by doing some research on Chad. I found out that he had a pretty big ego and loved to be the center of attention. So I started posting fake job ads on Craigslist and other job sites advertising a dream job with a six-figure salary in Chad's field. The catch. Applicants had to submit a video of themselves singing I Will Always Love You by Whitney Houston. Chad, of course, couldn't resist. He spent hours practicing and perfecting his rendition of the song and then sent in his video. But instead of getting a call back for an interview, he got a response from me. Sorry, Chad, but you didn't make the cut. Your performance wasn't quite up to par. I could practically hear him screaming in frustration from across town. But I wasn't done yet. I sent fake rejection emails to all the other people who submitted videos too, just to make it seem like it was a legitimate job search. Chad tried to confront me about it, but I just played dumb. I don't know what you're talking about, Chad. Maybe you just weren't good enough for the job. He stormed off in a huff, but I could see the rage boiling beneath the surface. He was the type of person who couldn't handle being humiliated, and I knew I had him right where I wanted him. Over the next few weeks, I stepped up my revenge game. I hacked into Chad's social media accounts and posted embarrassing photos and videos, like the time he got so drunk he passed out in a public restroom, or the time he tried to do a backflip off a diving board and belly flopped into the water. I even started spreading rumors about him around town, telling people that he had a secret obsession with collecting stuffed animals and that he had a bizarre fear of cucumbers. At first, Chad and his friends tried to retaliate. They sent me angry messages and even tried to prank me a few times. But I was always one step ahead of them. I knew all their favorite hangout spots and the bars they liked to go to, so I would show up before them and pay off the bartenders to give them watered, down drinks, or refuse to serve them all together. It was a lot of work, but it was worth it to see Chad and his friends squirming in frustration. They couldn't figure out who was behind all the pranks and the rumors, and it was driving them crazy. One day, Chad cornered me in the coffee shop where we had first met. Okay, Sophie, he said, his face red with anger. What's your problem? Why are you doing all this to us? I just smirked at him. You really don't get it, do you? You and your friends have been bullying me ever since we met. You've made fun of everything I do and say, and you've made me feel like crap. So now it's my turn to make you feel a little uncomfortable. Chad looked like he was about to explode, but I just turned on my heel and walked out of the coffee shop feeling triumphant. The revenge didn't stop there, though. I kept up my pranks and my rumors for months, until finally Chad and his friends had had enough. They confronted me one last time, telling me that they were going to get the police involved if I didn't stop harassing them. I just laughed in their faces. You're the ones who started it, I said. And now you're reaping what you sowed. In the end, Chad and his friends left me alone. They knew they couldn't win against me, and they didn't want to risk getting caught up in any legal trouble. I felt a sense of satisfaction knowing that I had taken control of the situation and taught them a lesson they wouldn't soon forget. I may not have made any lifelong friends from that experience, but at least I learned that I'm not someone to mess with. My school had a tradition, and I'm not sure if it's odd or not, but each year we had kind of a mini valedictorian award, starting in middle school. I was in the gifted program, so several of us had 4.0s, so the award was given to whoever had the highest overall GPA on the 100-point scale. I have always been very competitive by nature, so I set my sights on winning this award in the seventh grade. However, there was a bit of competition. Let's call him Todd. Todd had really good grades as well, with the top spot usually bouncing back and forth between the two of us. It was so close that every single quiz, exam, and homework assignment had the potential to dethrone one of us while lifting the other. I had an average of 98, 
something, as did he. Todd had a bit of an edge, however. See, Todd's mom was known for being a bully. She would yell, scream, berate, and openly mock any teacher who dared to give Todd a lower grade than me. But that isn't all. Todd's mom was also a teacher at our school. She would openly defy and berate her own colleagues, should they not provide whatever grade she wanted for Todd. Now, usually the school would avoid giving a child a class with their mother, but sometimes this was unavoidable. Naturally, we ended up in a class with his mother as the teacher. This was a world history class, one which required several papers, tests, etc. By the end of the year, Todd and I had been neck and neck in this class. But I noticed something. I consistently outperformed Todd by several points. On any objective learning assessments, fill-in-the-blank tests, multiple choice, etc. However, somehow Todd consistently outperformed me on written subjective learning assessments, papers, essays, etc. Being a young and ignorant kid, I just assumed he was better at writing. That is, until our final assignment rolled around. All our tests had been taken. All our quizzes and homework assignments graded. All our papers submitted and graded. The semester was functionally complete. I held a fraction of a point over Todd in the class, which put me overall ahead in the valedictorian race. But Mommy Dears couldn't have that. So with three days left of the year, she assigned a list minute two-page paper. Short and simple. I submitted mine and received a 95. Fair enough. I found out that Todd got a 100, just enough to put him ahead of me in the class and in the valedictorian race. I was frustrated, so I asked Todd to see his paper repeatedly, desperate to find ways to improve to better my chances the next year. He refused again and again. Then I remembered, when his mom handed the papers back to us, she never gave one to Todd. He hadn't done the paper. It was purely an assignment contrived to put him ahead. Now comes the revenge. Our school had just transferred to a paperless gradebook system the year before, so this was the second year on it. The principal was determined to make this cost efficient, so after the first trial year, he didn't even bother restocking the teachers with physical grade books. That way, he could add the amount saved from physical books to the total amount that the new paperless system was saving the school. Now, during this time, I also worked. I had a family member who owned a small local ISAP, and I would help out at every opportunity. I loved computers, and still do. Now. Working with this family member equipped me with much more networking knowledge than other kids my age, and even most adults. I decided that with this power came great responsibility. I was going to right this grievous injustice. So, I started digging. I got on a school PC and started going through the network. Turns out the school had wanted to save as much money as possible while going paperless. So, they didn't hire a professional technician, consultant, or anything. One of the dads just volunteered in exchange for a reduced tuition charge, private school. So this system was just a nightmare. There was no dedicated network for sharing grades. There was no password protection on any files. There were no administrative restrictions on any files. Nothing. What he did was just share a single directory on the headmaster's computer. That directory held the entire gradebook for each and every class of each and every grade, kindergarten through 12th grade. I thought this was too good to be true. Surely there were backups somewhere. So I went to the school's port switcher, which was just in an unlocked closet. I checked around, expecting to see a server or a set of drives set to automatically back up whatever is shared on the network. Nada, nada. Now I was in a rage. I'd gone to the principal several times, pointing out that Todd's mom was abusing her position. She was bullying teachers to give her kid an ed. Her son would even brag about how he could get away with not doing homework in other classes because mommy would make sure nothing came of it. But the principal had failed to act. He had declared that each teacher was sovereign in their classrooms. So long as nothing illegal happened, he would not intervene. He was a very unprincipled principal. So I made a decision to delete the nepotism happening. I couldn't just change my grades in her class. She monitored my average like a hawk. So, I went nuclear. I went into that subdirectory and deleted every single file in it. But, the principal had shared his whole user's desktop directory. So, I emptied the recycling. I completely wiped every trace of grading software on that computer because the idiot didn't even put a password on the computer. 
So from the desktop subdirectory, I was able to access everything. This was in the very last couple of days of school. There were no hard copies, grade books. There were no backups. There's nothing remaining to even prove that the school year ever occurred. On the final day of school, we get called into an assembly. The principal is visibly disheveled, shaken, and upset. Not even angry, just broken. He announced that the entire year of grades were totally lost. The school didn't know what to do because there were no hard copies. They couldn't recover the data because they cheaped out and didn't purchase a backup system. All they could do was reinstall the software. But on grading software, if there is no grade to input, then what does it default to when showing the grades of the students? Uh, 100%. Every single student in that school got valedictorian of their class that year. 100 and all around. Heck, even a few kids got enough of a boost from that final year that they got to graduate on time instead of being held back. Next year, we had a new principal. I was held slightly suspect since everyone knew of my tech background, but nobody could prove anything. Even the PCs in the computer lab didn't have usernames or passwords, so there was no way to link me to anything. The following year, security cameras and passwords were put in the computer lab. Thanks for joining us. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe for more captivating stories. Share your own experiences, opinions in the comments below, and let's keep the conversation going. Until next time, stay tuned for more epic tales.